Thank you for watching Missions Encounter. We are on Facebook, we are on uh, YouTube, and different social medias, and sometimes we're on the uh, Adwa TV there in Israel, the land of Israel and Palestine. So uh, we hope that you keep tuning in, and I want to share some scripture with you today. But I want you to go to Amazon.com and get my book, The Troubled Churches and uh, my dreams and visions. So I talked about that last week. And once you go to Amazon.com, look for books by Ronnie Waters. There's two or three other books there. Uh, one on Tribulation Saints and uh, the Seven Churches of Revelation. And one on uh, uh, how Vietnam wrecked my life. So get those books. I hope that you can get something good out of it. Hope that it'll help you and bless you and let's get into the Word of God today. In the third chapter of Acts, there's an incident that happened here as uh, Peter and John were going into the temple. And it says in verse 1 of chapter 3, Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour of the day. Now the Jews, uh, when, they, when they were writing this, the ninth hour of the day was considered like three uh, p uh, 3 p.m., which 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And they numbered it, they started their days like with 6 o'clock in the morning. That was the first hour. And then the third hour of the day would have been 9 o'clock. The sixth hour of the day would have been high noon. The ninth hour of the day would have been 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And the twelfth, uh, twelfth hour would have been 6 o'clock in the evening. So that's how. Uh, it's written here. It says, A certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple. He, he was begging for money. And nothing wrong with that, because, you know, he was uh, crippled from uh, the time he was born. He was born that way. So, Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms. He asked them an alms when he saw them. Peter fastened his eyes upon him and said, and upon him with John, and said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, I give thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and his ankle bones received strength. And he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. Now this was indeed a miracle. This man had never walked in his life. He had never stood up. He had never stretched his legs out, never stood on them, uh, or used them for anything. He was born this way, crippled uh, from birth. So... This was indeed a miracle. No one had ever seen this man walk in his lifetime because he never, he never could walk because he was lame, it says. He was not able to walk or even stand up. But Peter grabbed him and said, Get up, you know, in the name of Jesus, and receive what I give you. Because I can't give you silver and gold because we have none. But what I do is give you by the power and by the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. He stood and leaped and he walked and he entered with them into the temple, walking and praising and leaping and praising God. Now all the people saw him walking and praising, and praising God. He'd been there at the temple daily. They had put him there uh, on the porch steps of the temple every day. He was there. But now he was leaping and walking and praising God. And they knew that it was he which for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. And as the lame man which was healed held Peter and John, all the people ran together unto him. Now, this lame man was now holding Peter and John. <laughs> I always took this to mean literally what it, what it says. He was holding them. You know, I just see him standing there. One, one man in the other arm, and the other arm, you know, Peter and John, holding them up 
and he had received a definite miracle from God. And so uh, the lame man which was healed held Peter and John. All the people ran together unto them in the porch, which is called Solomon's Great, greatly wondering. All the people were gathering. Well, oh, look at this man. He is now, he's no longer lame, but he's now carrying Peter and John around. And so Peter saw it, uh, the crowd that was coming. He said, he answered unto the people, Ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Or why look ye so earnestly on us, as though by our own power, our holiness, we have made this man to walk? He let them know right away, I'm not going to take any glory from God because God did this. We didn't do this. It was the power of Jesus' name. And the God, he said, the God of Abraham and Isaac and of Jacob and the God of our fathers hath glorified his son, Jesus Christ, whom you delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But you denied the Holy One and the just and desired a murderer to be granted unto you and killed the Prince of Life whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. And they were witnesses of that. And he said, this is the power of Jesus Christ, the one you crucified, the one you rejected. And his name, through faith in his name, hath made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. You see, when God does a healing job, he does it well. He does it perfect. And, you know, you can know that a miracle's from God when it's, it's done, you know. And there's no question about it. You can't explain it other than it's a miracle. It comes from God. Amen. And now, brethren, I want that through ignorance you did it, as did also your rulers. You crucified Christ through your ignorance. Remember Jesus on the cross? He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And but those things which God before had showed him, had showed by the mouth of all his prophets, that Christ should suffer, and he hath so fulfilled. All through the Old Testament, prophesied of this happening, that he, Jesus would be uh, the lamb slain before the foundation of the world, that he would be the lamb that re would redeem Israel and redeem the world. Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. For Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren. Like unto me, him shall you hear in all things whatsoever he shall say. A prophet, he said, prophesied, would come, and uh, he would come. He said, this Old Testament prophecy was fulfilled here. The Old Testament prophecy that was given in Deuteronomy chapter 18 and uh, where he said to Moses, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. This was God delivering this message to Moses. Him shall you hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. It shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. Yea, and all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow him, as many as have spoken, have likewise foretold of all these things. Ye are the children of the prophets, and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, And in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. All the earth would be blessed through him. And certainly it is, it is true unto you first, God, having raised up his son, Jesus Christ, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. Now, this was a great miracle, and it, gave them, it opened up an opportunity uh, for Peter and John to, to preach the word to, these, to the people, to explain why Jesus came, what happened in his crucifixion, and that he arose, and that he uh, is now on the throne in heaven and waiting for the time when he shall return. And as they spake unto the people, 
the priests and the captains of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them. Now here come the religious people in chapter 4, verse 1. All of these miracles were happening and, and the early disciples, but yet, uh, and it created many of the common people, many of the common people came and received Christ as Lord and Savior. We're filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke in tongues and, and give glory to God and observe the healing powers the healing power and miracle power of the name of through the name of Jesus Christ, and as these uh, the captain of the temple and the priests and the Sadducees wouldn't you know it the group of religious fanatics of that day the Sadducees properly named Sad you see and they came upon him being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in hold until the next day, for it was now even tied. They began to uh, throw them in their own jail, take authority upon themselves, these religious leaders, to throw them in jail and keep a hold. They, till the next day they laid hands on them. Now, it says, Howbeit many of them which heard the word believed. And the number of the men was about 5,000. 5,000 men alone believed this message that Peter preached to them about Christ and the power of his name. And it came to pass on the morrow that their rulers and elders and scribes and Annas the high priest, see, they got everybody involved, everybody uh, in politics. They got, they got the rulers involved in this spiritual uh, conflict, in this religious conflict, if you want to call it that. Uh, in, in what was really happening was revival. It was the power of God at work through the name of Jesus Christ. It was all good things, but yet uh, they wanted to question it. They wanted to, because it was kind of coming against their religious beliefs. You know, religion has been one of man's worst downfalls. Hello? Religion uh, is not something uh, that's really going to bring deliverance. To, to many people who, who believe that their religion is going to going to save them. But religion will not save you because it's full of man's doctrines. And doctrines, even even uh, spoken of in the New Testament, as doctrines of devils. At all. Yeah, there's, there's, uh, there's in belief, uh, unbelief, many, many people with unbelief involved in these things, the rulers, and they doubt everything, they criticize everything, every miracle of God, all oh, that can't be God, you know, oh, God would do that. How do you know what God would do? But they took it upon themselves. Well, we got to put a stop to this. We got to throw a wet blanket on this, on the power uh, uh, through this name of Jesus because they were afraid that they would lose their position if all the people believed, which many of them did. Here was 5,000 5, men. It doesn't describe the, the families or anything, but 5,000 men uh, believed on Jesus here. It says that on the morrow, their rulers and elders and scribes, they got, they got all the old fogies involved, you know, all the old religious leaders, they got to get them involved. And Annas, the high priest, oh, they got all the way to the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander, as many as were of the kindred of the high priest, were gathered together at Jerusalem, had a big religious meeting, hello, but God wasn't in the midst of it. God was not performing miracles in their religious meeting, but God was performing miracles through the hands uh, uh, of Peter and John here, who laid their hands upon people and in the name of Jesus Christ brought deliverance and miracle working power, healing and deliverance and salvation. And but it says when they had set them in the midst, they set these disciples right in the midst. All right. They put them in other words, they called them on the carpet. It says, By what power or by what name have you done this? See, they were they were uh, simply uh, uh, suggesting, well, this must be a, a power, an evil power. This this must be where you're you're dealing with demons and and, and uh, you're 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 doing all these things which the the law of Moses forbids. You know, not to be talking to the dead and and, and not to be uh, using the power of Satan. They called it the power of Satan, and you know what? That's that's very close to blasphemy. Because Jesus accused them at one time when he was uh, doing miracles and everything. And they accused him, the Pharisees and Sadducees, they come along and they said, you know, yeah, you do these things by the power of Beelzebub. 
which was the name of the devil. And Jesus said, be careful now. You can blaspheme my name. You can blaspheme God. But don't you blaspheme uh, the, the Holy Ghost. Because these are the works of the Holy Ghost that are being done. Because he was just a man. And God wasn't... Uh, God was working through him, but through the power of the Holy Ghost, the third person of the Trinity. It was the Holy Ghost at work, and he was, he was doing the miracles through Christ as a human vessel. And when he laid hands on people, when he spoke to them, and the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit, went out and did the work in all the people and created... Uh, and and restored and healed and delivered and set free demons left people uh, left their their lives and were cast out through the name of Jesus through the power by the power of the Holy Ghost he was at work and John or Jesus said to them he said be careful you're about to commit uh, the unforgivable sin. He said, you shall be forgiven if you blaspheme my name. You shall be forgiven if you blaspheme the name of God. But don't you dare call the works of the Holy Ghost. Don't you dare call it the works of Satan because you're blaspheming the Holy Ghost and there will be no forgiveness for those who blaspheme the work of the Holy Ghost and what he's doing in this world. He operates differently from the Godhead. I mean, he is part of the God, but he operates differently from God and Jesus. They're all about love, and they're, they're all about forgiveness. But the Holy Ghost, he is the operating spirit of God that goes out to do in this world. Right now, he's in the world taking the place of Christ until he returns. In, uh, I believe it's the 15th chapter of John, where uh, they were uh, talking about, or Jesus was talking about, that uh, he was going to have to leave. And his disciples said, no, no, you're going to stay with us. But he said, no, it's expedient for you that I go away, which means profitable. For if I go not away, he said, the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, cannot come. You don't need the Holy Ghost here and me, he's saying. You know, when I leave, the Holy Ghost is going to come and take my place. And he did. Forty days after, uh, I believe 50 days after Christ was crucified, because Christ was resurrected, and he appeared to his disciples for 40 days. And then he was ascended up on the Mount of Olives. And 10 days later, the 50th day after Passover, with Pentecost, that's what that Passover, the Passover Pentecost is. It's a Passover of 50 days. It means literally 50. Pentecost means 50. And that means, you know, when the Holy Ghost came on the day of Pentecost, it talks about in the second chapter of the book of Acts, when he came, he came with a mighty rushing sound. And uh, the sound of wind. It didn't say there was wind, but it said the mighty rushing sound of wind came. And there was a tongue of fire that lighted upon each one of them. Read it, Acts 2 and verses 1 through 4. Most of you are avoiding that. You don't want to read it out to your congregation. You don't want to tell them about the, uh, the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You say, oh, well, we get saved. Well, you get the baptism. You get the Holy Ghost. Well, you don't get the, you may get the work of the Holy Spirit because salvation is a work of the Holy Spirit, but it is not the baptism. It is not the gift. And so when baptism comes, uh, then the evidence of the Holy Spirit will begin to flow through a person because the, the tongues, were, they all spoke with tongues, other tongues, it says, as the Spirit gave them utterance. That's what it says, verses 1 through 4. As the Spirit gave them utterance. And so the Spirit was now there in the church and give, through believers, filling them with the gift of the Holy Ghost. And He was expressing Himself through them with other tongues, which was giving praise and honor to God. See, there's a gift of tongues that people can receive after they've received the, whole, the gift of the Holy Ghost. There are several gifts, and it, Peter, or not Peter, but Paul, talked about them in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and, th and chapter 13 and chapter 14. And I suggest you study those chapters and you get an idea of the gifts of the Spirit that will be in operation. There's uh, categories of gifts. There's power, miracle gifts. There's oratory gifts, tongues, interpretation of tongues and prophecy would be the oratorial gifts. 
There's gifts of knowledge and wisdom and discerning of spirits, which is uh, a different type of gift. And so there was, I think, 12 mentioned there, the gifts of the Spirit. And throw, so even a gift of faith that operates. Not just faith, but a gift of faith. Amen. And so God does things in a great way, and He does things right. And the Holy Ghost is carrying out the work of the Lord. And these, these uh, disciples, Peter and John, they got in trouble by uh, speaking in the name of Jesus. And they asked Him, say, by what power? Or by what name have you done this? They recognized. They wanted them to be exposed and, 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 and blame them to be speaking through the power of Satan, through his name. Then Peter said, filled with the Holy Ghost unto them, ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if, you, if we this day will be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which was set at the knot of you builders, which is become the head of the corner. Talking about Christ, this is the stone, he said. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. We must be saved under heaven the name of Jesus. There is none other name given whereby we must be saved. This Jesus, this Jesus that brings the gift of salvation to the believers. Neither is there salvation in any other. There is no other power. There is no other God, no other demon, no other spirit that can give salvation other than through Jesus. He is the Savior of the world. And he said, when they saw their boldness of Peter and John, and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men. They marveled, and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Beholding the man which was healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the temple, they conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do to these men? For that indeed a notable miracle hath been done by them is manifest to all them, that dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. They couldn't deny the miracle. But that it spread no further among the people, let us straightly threaten them that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge you. But we, for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard.